In this video I'm going to show how to build a small induction heater which uses a rapidly alternating magnetic field that can heat up or even melt metals. The heater is driven by a circuit called a ZBS driver, which is an extremely efficient high frequency oscillator using two MOSFETs to move high current. Let's have a look at how the driver works. When power is applied, the MOSFET gates are charged through the two charging resistors and they both start to conduct. At the same time, current starts flowing through the two chokes through the inductive load and charges the tank capacitor. One MOSFET will inevitably be slightly less conductive than the other one, and this will cause an imbalance that will kick off the oscillation. As the voltage on the leg of the conducting MOSFET rises, the voltage on the leg of the opposite MOSFET drops. Eventually, that voltage will drop far enough that the gate diode will start conducting to the opposite leg and pull down the gate of the conducting MOSFET, which will shut it off, and begin to turn on the opposite MOSFET. This cycle will repeat itself naturally, and turn the MOSFETs on and off at the resonant frequency of the LC circuit. Because the oscillation is happening at resonance, the circuit is extremely efficient. One aspect of this circuit that's particularly important is the value of the inductive chokes, which limit inrush current and buffer the power supply from the oscillation. I've set up a simulation in my web browser to show the effect of the chokes. Here I have a pair of 100 micro Henry chokes. In the bottom left is a graph of the current coming out of the power supply, and to the right of it is the current across the inductive load. Notice that the power supply current spikes a little bit, but afterward is relatively steady, even though there's a very large oscillation across the inductive load. This time I've reduced the choke values from 100 microhenry to just 1 microhenry. Watch the supply current in the bottom window. It spikes to nearly 50 amps at startup and never really reaches a steady output. Instead, it oscillates with the circuit because there's so little impedance to buffer it from the alternating current. This issue becomes even more important as your frequency goes down because an inductor's impedance is proportional to the frequency. The bottom line is that the bigger the chokes you have, the better. I've salvaged quite a few of these over the years, so I should be able to find something that works. I'm going to solder everything onto a 70 by 50 millimeter perf board and start with two 100 microhenry chokes. Next I solder on the gate resistors, each of which consists of three 1200 ohm resistors in parallel to effectively create a 400 ohm resistor. Then come the gate protection zener diodes. I didn't have 12 volt zener diodes, so I put two 5.6 volt diodes in series, which for me is close enough. And these are the 10k ohm gate pull down resistors. The MOSFETs are IRF44s. These are cheap and plentiful, but their drain to source voltage rating means I can only feed this circuit with about 16 volts maximum. Next I solder 10 caps in parallel to form a 1 microfarad bank. The last piece of gate control circuitry are the gate pull down diodes. These are 1N4148s. These wires connect the diodes to the opposite legs of the inductive load. The heater coil is made from 5 turns of 20 gauge wire. And the last piece of the circuit is this power connector. Now I'm going to hook it all up and turn on my power supply, which instantly goes into overcurrent protection. Something's wrong. It turned out my capacitors were too tiny and they instantly blew up, so I replaced them with something a little bigger. Let's hook it up again and retry this. And that's exactly what I wanted to see. A perfectly clean sine wave, and it's just over 100 kilohertz, which is exactly what I wanted, since most induction heaters operate around 100 to 200 kilohertz. Now let's test it out on a piece of metal. The first thing I tried was a zinc-coated steel screw. It got hot enough to boil water, but it didn't get red hot. I tried with a hex nut and washer, but those didn't get red hot either. 
It turned out there's also quite a bit of heating in the coil itself, and my 20 gauge coil didn't last long. I guess this is why you see higher powered induction coils using hollow tubing with water pumped through them. Let's try this again with 10 gauge solid wire. This X-Acto knife blade doesn't have much mass, so it shouldn't be as hard to get it red hot. Here I'm running the circuit at 16 volts and 5 amps. Any higher than that and there's a good chance I'll damage my MOSFETs. Next, some 20 gauge tie wire. Then I test some small screwdrivers. If we look at the power supply, you can see that the metal object puts a load on the circuit as I move the screwdriver in and out of the heater coil. I originally thought this process would change the inductance of the coil by having the metal act as a weak core, but when I watch the oscilloscope, I see the frequency remains constant, which means the inductance stays the same. One problem I discovered is that the capacitor gets super hot after only a minute or so of use. Eventually it bulged and even cracked, causing failure. In the future, I'll probably need to put several of these in parallel to spread out the load. The last thing I want to show is another use for this CVS driver. I built a transformer that has a 10 to 1 step up ratio, and I'm going to show what the input and output looks like on my oscilloscope. When 10 volts is applied to the circuit, 28 volts develops across the inductive load, nearly three times the input voltage. This is the reason I'm limited to about 16 volts of input, because it brings me very close to the 55 volt drain to source voltage limit of my MOSFETs. Here I'm going to adjust my input voltage until my load voltage is about 20 volts. This happens at about 6.4 volts of input. Then I'm going to set my oscilloscope probe to 10x mode and attach it to the transformer output. This means that whatever the oscilloscope reads is actually one tenth of the real voltage and I get exactly what I expected. The scope shows 20 volts, meaning the transformer is actually outputting 200 volts. If you look at the graph, you'll see it go on and off the chart as I cycle between 1x and 10x mode. In a future video, I'll use this driver to power a transformer that will turn 12 volts into 12,000 volts.